we're stepping out of the mix of faith and anointing, which is man and Holy Spirit. And we're stepping into the times of glory, which is God. God alone, right? He doesn't need our help. He just needs us surrendered and submitted to him. But the time is of glory. And it says when darkness covers the earth and dense darkness the peoples, that the glory of the Lord will shine upon you. It's the glory of the Lord. And the glory of the Lord is a defense. It covers you like a canopy. It actually is, is a defense in the realm of the spirit. And even if you go to an open air wedding or something like that and there's midges or mozzies, you can just release the glory of God and those little things will not come near you. It, it works. I do it all the time. I release the glory of God. You can re the, release the glory of God when you go into situations and circumstances. You release the glory. You release the glory, the presence of God. You just release it and you release it as God released what he made through the words of your mouth. You just release You say, oh, God, I just want to thank you. I release your glory into this situation. I release your glory into this circumstance. I release your glory into my family. I release your glory into this relationship. I release your glory into, this, into what I'm stepping into. I release your glory, God. I release your glory as a defense. I release your glory as a canopy over my life. I release your glory. I release your glory, Lord. I release your glory. Oh, praise you, God, for the power of the glory, the, the very presence of God. Lord, we thank you that we are stepping into a season in the realm of the Spirit where it's the power of the glory that is going to be released upon the earth. It's the power of the glory that is going to touch and change nations. It's the power of the glory, Lord. And Father God, we ask you to teach us how to flow with the glory. Ask, we ask you to make us skilled in ministering with your glory, that we would recognize when your glory comes, that we would be able to flow with it, that we would be able to see it in the spirit. And Lord, we thank you that as gross darkness covers the peoples of the earth, the light of your glory is seen upon your people. And we give you praise and honor and worship in Jesus' name. In Jesus, this is really stepping into a season of glory. It's a season of glory. And that means that, you know, like in, in, the, in the anointing, it's a mix of, of, of people and the Holy Ghost. Because in the anointing, it's a mix of faith, which we activate. Faith is activated by us. And then it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So it's a mix. You know, we're working with the Holy Spirit. Do we have otter? So it's, it's a mix. But when you step into the glory, there's no room for the flesh. No. Now, right, there's no room for us. It's just God. And I just want to see God move, right? Yeah. Just, we just want to see God do it. Um, and I've been involved enough to know that I can mess up anything. Yeah. I can mess up anything. And God's constantly redeeming. But it's the power of the glory. Yeah. And there was a man who was ministering in uh, Africa. He had one suit, one suit, and he had been in Africa for years. But when he put his tent up and held his meetings, no moths, no midges, no mosquitoes, nothing could enter the tent at night, right? Because the glory would not allow it. But his suit always looked brand new and immaculate because of the glory that was on his life. Yeah. And we can get to this. You know, the glory was so strong in, what was it, Elijah or Elisha? When they chucked him in the grave, when he died, I mean, he died, and then they chucked a dead man's body on top of it. And it, the, the anointing, the glory was so strong in his bones that the guy that was dead chucked yeah. into it because comes to life, right? Yeah. It's just that we've got to open ourselves up to so much more yeah. than what we experience and what we know anything about. So much more because God wants to do the amazing. He wants to do the incredible. He wants to do the mind blowing. He wants to do stuff that just, he really loves to show off mm. in the nicest way, but God loves to show off. And, uh, and we've, got to allow, we've got to step back and allow him to do that because what we're ushering in, church age is finished. And what we are ushering in is the kingdom age. We're ushering in the kingdom. And when you're ushering in the kingdom, you are ushering in the king. Jesus, the king. And we need to learn to relate to him as a king. Yes, we're his friends. 
John 15, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, I call you my friends. But he's also our king. And we need to learn how to work with him as king, as friend, all these different hats that we kind of wear. But you know, when you've got a friend that has walked with you for years, you, you kind of flow in the different aspects of your relationship with that person. You know, like you, you walk in as a deep friend and think, oh, and then it's just you flow with the friendship. You flow with the relationship because you've been friends for a long time and you understand how it works. Well, I believe that the Holy Spirit is wanting to take us deeper into this relationship with our Jesus, who is the most magnificent of all, and take us deeper with him, but also t show us how to release kingdom on earth. Because unless you see yourself seated with him in heavenly places, unless you see yourself one with him, absolutely indivisible, like in such unity, nothing can separate you. It's going to be a struggle. But when you know that you are one with him, that you're in Christ and Christ is in you and you're in the Father and the Father's in you and Jesus and the Father manifest themselves to you, you've got this amazing relationship. When all of this is happening, then there's a whole new manifestation of our Father and his kingdom on the earth. And our nation needs it. Our families need it. The kids at school need it. And so it's recognising that, okay, church age is coming to an end. So then I have to be aware now that some of the structures that I have in place of how I have a relationship with Father, Son and Holy Spirit might have to shift because now it's kingdom. It's no longer church. That's an old wine skin. So I have to let go of the old wine skin. I have to let go of the old wine and allow the Holy Spirit to, to fill me up with new wine and make me a new wine skin so that I can flow with what God's doing. And a lot of it's going to be glory. And, you know, Kenneth Hagen would have glory meetings where they'd, be, they'd have meetings and then, you know, the glory would start at the back of the hall and it would just roll forward like a cloud and everybody would be silent, even the children, the babies, just so caught up in the presence of God. It was like nobody moved, nobody, they breathed, but it didn't seem like they were. And there were times when they even saw purple glory, the majestic glory of God roll into, into meetings. And this is where we're headed again, because Kenneth Hagin was a forerunner. He was ahead of his time in so many ways, you know, and he paved the way. Um, and he paved the way in so many ways. Um, and he was a forerunner of the glory. And one of the things that he regularly did, and I would challenge you because I'm doing it, um, he got as many of the scriptures that contained the word glory as he could find. And he would meditate them over and over again to build in him a relationship with the glory. So that, you know, it would... Because you, you, where your thoughts go is what manifests in your life. Yeah. And so he would, manif he would think on the glory and the glory things would come. There's Anna, oh, what's her name? Anna Mendez Farrell, I think is her name. Incredible intercessor. But she releases glory bombs. Kapow. Send a glory bomb. Kaboom. But amazing things happen when she sends those glory bombs. But you, you, again, it's the revelation that she's got. You know, if I send a glory bomb because I read that she does, yes. no effect really. Might be a little bit, might be a bit of a sprinkle because God is gracious. But until I get the revelation, yeah. it's a bit pointless. It's like, you know, Kenneth Kagan, uh, Copeland gave away his car and got this amazing car back. So everybody on the Gold Coast back in the day was giving away their cars like it was incredible because <coughs> if it worked for Kenneth Copeland or whoever, it would work for me, right? But it was his revelation, not ours. Yeah. Yeah. And so everybody was giving away cars and the number of Christians that then had to buy another car or were busing it wherever they wanted to go because we did it because, oh, that's, but look at what he got. We looked at what he got yeah. instead of the relationship that he had and the revelation that, that <coughs> put him to that place. We want what people got, have got without going through the process. Like if I want a certain thing in somebody else's life, I've got to pay the price. Yeah. I prefer to say, make the investment. 
you know, so we've got to make that investment to get what other people have if that's what you want. But we're stepping into this glory time and kingdom time. And that's what, and church has definitely come to an end. The number of churches on the Gold Coast, our city should have been changed. There should have been one church. There should have been a unity. And we're working on it, you know, like we have the pastor's retreat um, and all of that kind of stuff. We're, we're working on it. There's about 70 pastors on the coast that come together regularly. We go away annually for retreats and things like that. We're working on bringing unity into the, into the body, into the Gold Coast. But a couple of how many hundreds of churches on the Gold Coast, if you count all the little ones and the big ones and all denominations. And yet have we transformed our community? No. No. And so there's, there's, we're missing it. We're missing it. Because even when Paul went in Ephesus, you know, and he preached, man, the whole town went berserk. First of all, you know, like he's destroying the idols that we've all protected. But then they all came out and they burnt all those, those books of magic and witchcraft that they had. And they repented. The whole town repented before God. There wasn't any prayer walks. There wasn't anything like that. What there was was a man who was preaching truth with such authority and power that the anointing went past the group he was speaking to and into the town. It's like Morris Cirillo, right, when he goes to Africa. Um, the witch doctors say, don't go within 70 miles of his preaching because you'll either be converted or die. And stay away for 21 days after he's left because you don't want any residue coming against you. We can't stand against it. See, they paid the price to get that, that anointing. St. Xavier, who stepped off the boat in 1500s in, in Italy and put his foot on a, on a, on a jetty in, um, or the pier in a town in Italy on his way to Japan. And there was a plague in the town when he put his foot on that, on that pier. I can't think of the but pier will do. When he put his foot on that pier, the people saw the plague leave the town. They saw the demonic force of that plague just go, Right? So these people paid the price and we've got to get, if you want the same kind of results, then you're going to have to pay the same kind of price. And I want those kind of results. I want to see the glory of God released upon the earth. I want people to go, man, there is a God. Look how powerful he is. David, Joseph, Daniel, you know, um, so many of them. And if you haven't been doing the KI things that I do every Tuesday night, last Tuesday we had to change the dates for this month because I'm in Singapore. Um, so we did one last month and then the next one will be 19th. Um, it's all on knowing your assignment, how to get your assignment, how to recognise what your assignment is. And if you want to see it, the first part, get in touch with Danny. She'll send you the email link. Second part is on the 19th. It's really well worth watching. Um, and, and it just little things that we, we start to put together and think, oh, okay, now I, I have an understanding of where God's taking me and, and what my destiny is and what the assignment is that he's called me to. But it's in a kingdom assignment. This is the thing. It's a kingdom assignment. And kingdom is mentioned. Let me just get this right. Kingdom is mentioned. Um, I wrote it down somewhere. 342 times in scripture, 127 times in the four gospels, 37 times in Matthew alone. And Matthew is known as the, as the, the gospel of the kingdom. And that word kingdom is basileia, which basically means the reign and the rule of God. So the kingdom of God, when it comes, the kingdom of God is made up of four components. It's made up, number one, of the territory, the domain. So let me say something. The kingdom of God is within us, right? Yeah. So I would say that the kingdom of God, I would be the domain of the kingdom of God in my life. However, if I've submitted everything to God but finances, then my finances are not under his domain. It's what we willingly bring. It's what we willingly bring. And so it's recognising that the kingdom of God is within you, that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Therefore, you are the domain of the kingdom. You are part of the territory. I mean, there's a heavenly territory, but on earth, 
it's the body of Christ. So it's the, 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 one of the components is the territory or the land. It's the domain of the kingdom. The second one is the citizens. You can't have a kingdom without citizens. And Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 says that we are, let me just get there. We are citizens of the state which is in heaven and from it we earnestly and patiently await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Saviour. So we are citizens of heaven. First and foremost, before I am an Australian citizen and I praise God for my Aussie citizenship, but before that I'm a citizen of heaven. So the kingdom has, a, as the land has a territory and it has citizens the third thing it has is laws. There are governmental laws. There are protocols. There are procedures. There are policies. Every kingdom has them. If you want to see King Charles, there are policies, protocols. You know, like one of the pro protocols when Queen Elizabeth was alive, do not touch the queen. And we all remember one of the American presidents touched the queen, put his hand on her back, you know, like, oh, he broke protocol. Um, but, you know, but there are protocols. And sometimes if we don't understand the protocols or the policies of the kingdom, then we can find ourselves with a bit of a backlash. We need to understand that there are laws, citizen laws. In Australia, as an Australian citizen, if I you know, speed and I get caught, I have broken a law. So there's a consequence. Either a fine or lose some points or whatever it might be. There's consequences. It's the same in the kingdom of heaven. There are consequences. There's a consequence to every choice. Yeah. And because you are made in the image of God, your words will create. Whether it's life or death, there's no in between, there's no grey, there's no, what do you call it, neutral territory. You are made in the image of God and your words that come out of your mouth will create your world. And that's what a lot of Christians and believers don't understand, that the words that come out of your mouth on a regular basis, the ones that come out of a belief in your heart, they shape your world. And just turn for a minute to Hebrews. Chapter 11, verse 3. It says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed, fashioned, put in order and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God so that what we see was not made out of things which are visible. What we see is made out of things that are invisible. So the world was framed. It was put in order. It was um, uh, equipped for its intended purpose by the word of God. So being made in the image of God, the words that come out of your mouth will frame your world. It will equip your world. It will um, fashion your world. It will put it in order or disorder, depending on the words that you speak. So there was a friend of mine years ago when I worked at, an, um, at a school, a believer, and, um, and she would often, and we would have, you know, like in any school, there's, um, children going through a hard time. It might be a parent with cancer or something. The kids go through a hard time sometimes. And her, her expression was, it just makes my heart bleed. It just makes my heart bleed. She ended up in hospital with so many hemorrhages because that was what she believed. She spoke it out. See, what we don't understand, we truly don't get that when you speak... You speak as an oracle of God, whether it's death or life. You frame your world, your, your relationships, your finances, your health. We frame it by the words that we speak. It has been scientifically proven, not biblically proven, but scientifically proven that if they can get people to say three times a day that their blood pressure is, what is it, 120 over 80? Is that a good one? If your blood, so my blood pressure is 100, they've got high blood pressure or low blood pressure and they don't give them any medication except to say my blood pressure is perfect, it's 120 over 80. And they say that three times a day at the end of three months, guess what? Their blood pressure is perfect because we're made in the image of God. 
and what you say creates your world. And as kings, because you are all priests and kings, right? As kings, kings decree. And when kings make a decree, it is enforced. So kings will make a decree. As kings, you decree. I'm having a really bad day. Guess what? You have just framed your day. I struggle financially. Guess what? You have just framed your finances. And I know it's like blab it and grab it. What is it? Possess it and confess it. But it's not about that. It is about the fact that you are made in the image of God and what you speak creates or destroys. That's it. There's no grey. There's no in between. You either edify, build up with your words or you destroy. That's why David was so careful when Saul was chasing after him not to dishonour Saul in any way. Even when he had Saul and he could have done something to him, you know, when he went in, Saul went in to relieve himself in a cave and David was hidden in the back of it and I think they cut a little bit off his, take the hem off his garment. Um, and then he was going to do, but he decided not to because honour was more important than anything else. And so one of the things that we honour God with is the way that we speak. We honour God with the words that come out of our mouth. You know, I bless the Lord at all times. His praises will continually be in my mouth. Psalm 34 verse 1. So we honour him by the words that we speak. It is so important that we understand that as kings, when you release a decree, it is enforced either angelically or demonically. And so we have this amazing power. I had uh, another friend, or I guess friend, um, but the daughter of a pastor of a church I was going to when I was first born again. Uh, like I've been born again maybe a few years. And um, I was um, the secretary in the church to the pastor. And this woman, the pastor's daughter, had amazing, beautiful long hair, like down to here, like really long. But she kept saying, this hair is going to be the death of me. And so driving home, from a Christian meeting one night, a combined meeting, there was a car accident and it was her. And she drowned in about that much water because she couldn't get her hair unwrapped from the clutch handle, the um, brake, the handbrake thing. And so because her hair got caught in it, she couldn't free herself and she couldn't get, so she drowned. And it shouldn't have happened, but my hair will be the death of me. Right, you op we open the door. And this is something, you know, this is something that we don't get. I, I spent in Bible college, I taught 24, I think it's 20 or 24 hours a term on the power of a positive confession and the destruction of a negative one. Because you think about the things that we say, my back is killing me. You know, I, I'd kill for a cup of tea. Um, throw some others out there. Dying to know. Dying to know. <laughs> so, but there's all these kind of sayings that, you know, we sort of, and, and some of the Aussie sayings, you know, they're really curses. When it talks about, um, call blind me, is God blind me? Oh, wow. That's English. Yeah, that's English. But you came out here. <laughs> you know, and, and gee whiz, Jesus is a wizard. And bloody is defiling the blood of the lamb. You know, there's so many things that we say as Australians that release curses all the time. Yeah, but there's plenty of others, you know. That, and so we need to be very aware that we have to be the change that we want to see. I can pray for change, but unless I am actually part of the change that I want to see, all I'm doing is praying for change. I'm not participating in it. So we have to understand these things. So there is a kingdom that God is establishing upon the earth. And there is, and in that kingdom, there is territory. There is our citizens 
There are laws, rules, procedures, protocols are so important. Come into my gates with thanksgiving. Come into my courts with praise. There's a protocol right there. You know, it says in Timothy, if you want to pray, then first of all, you pray for those in positions of authority. Do we follow that? Do we pray for the king and his family first? Do we pray for the government before we pray for anything else? Most likely not. Usually we just go in and pray and ask for what we want for our family or our needs or whatever it might be. But in, in Timothy, it says, hey, if you're going to pray, then you pray this way first so that you can have a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we don't follow protocol. <clears throat> and the last one is that every kingdom has a king and ours is Jesus. That we have a king who possesses the authority to lead the citizens of the kingdom uh, into and, and oversee the government. So it's, we have this kingdom and this amazing Jesus, the king of glory, who is the king of all, majestic and beautiful. And in Psalm 145, verses 10 to 12, <clears throat> it says, Psalm 145, verse 10, all your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your loving ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men God's mighty deeds and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. So let me ask you, how often do we talk about the kingdom of God? Do we talk about its majesty? It says in verse 10, uh, verse 11, that we were to speak of the glory of your kingdom. We had to talk of your power. I think we need to change what we talk about a little bit. And then in verse 12, to make known to the sons of men, make known to people God's mighty deeds and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. How amazing he is. And so I really believe that we need to have a fresh revelation of the glory of the kingdom of God, of how majestic he is. Psalm 24, king of glory, open up your gates, open up your everlasting doors that the king of glory may come in. The king of glory may come in. Jesus, majestic Jesus, the one who is faithful and true, the one on the white horse, the one who's the hero, the one who's the champion, the one who comes to rescue his people, Jesus, the king of kings. He is amazing and wonderful. And it says, you know, like we're to talk about that. But what do we talk about? I'm as guilty as anyone. I, I can't, I don't talk that much about the kingdom, but I need to. Because I want to see the kingdom manifest. I want to see the kingdom manifest. It comes from that, that place of intimacy with him. One of the... Um, I don't even know why I'm bothering to turn the page. I don't even know where I am. <laughs> One of the challenges with moving into a kingdom mentality is that you are to walk and speak in divine authority. Church age, Father, would you please? God, I ask you to heal. God, I ask you to do this. God, I ask you, would you? that's church age. And that was fine for when the church was here, but now it's kingdom. So I'm not saying you come out and say, let there be. I'm asking, first of all, go and sit with the Father and ask him what he wants. How do you want me to decree? What do you want me to say? What is it that you want released into the heavenlies to bring about the downfall of the enemy? But when you stand up and you come out of your prayer closet, in your prayer closet, you're a priest. You worship, you minister, you intercede. You honour him. You listen. But when you come out of your prayer closet, you come out as the king because he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. You come out as that king and you decree what the Father has told you to decree. And you do it with authority. And this is the, the difference between the church age and the apostolic kingdom age is that we, we walk in apostolic authority. We walk in apostolic authority. Let there be. Be healed. Be gone. Apostolic authority. But first of all, we get that from the Father. Like Jesus, I only ever do the things he tells me to do. 
That is a narrow path. But you are here for such a time as that. You are here for this time, the narrow path time. And so it's recognising that... Um, um, there is an authority that comes with the apostolic slash kingdom age that you are to walk in. That you really have a, 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 a knowing like Joshua did, that every place the sole of your foot treads, God gives it to you. That the, he, that the enemy is under your feet. That the God of peace has placed him under your feet, not shortly, but now. Now. So you have this authority because the, the reason of the kingdom age, the apostolic release of the kingdom age is to bring heaven to earth. It is to release heaven on earth. It is so important. So there are five main, oh, here I go, I say five, hope I can remember. There are five main things that you are to look for in, in this apostolic kingdom age. One is the kingdom, the king and its kingdom. Two is covenant. We're a new covenant. We're not under the old covenant anymore. You know, there's over 80 differences between the old covenant and the new covenant. It's a completely different thing. So one is the king and his kingdom. Number two is covenant. Three is that God is our father. He's no longer God. Jesus, they said, Jesus, will you teach us to pray? And he said, when you pray, say, Father. That was a huge change. So there is Father. Four is the uh, Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit. And number five is restoration. Because Jesus came to restore all that was lost. So it's, I don't know if I can repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> the king and his kingdom, covenant, father, holy spirit and restoration. You know, and if and we start where we are. We don't start with the nation. We start where we are because we've got to learn the procedures and the protocols and the policies. So we start where we are with our own family. So where is it that there needs to be restoration of heaven on earth in your family? Where is it that there needs to be restoration of heaven on earth in your health? or your finances, or your relationships, at work. There's, you start where you are, and then you start looking and say, Father, I'm, I'm, I'm worshipping you, and I love, to, I love to minister to you, and, I, and you spend time in worship. But then you start to say, Father, now speak to me about this. Speak to me about my health. Speak to me about my finances. Speak to me about my family. Speak to me. What is it that you want to ask me? What is it that you want to tell me? Because I often find when I ask the question, it's the wrong question. So I say, Father, what is it you want me to ask you? And then it's like, ah, I would never have thought of asking that question. And that opens up a whole different thing. And then when he's talked to me and, he's, and, he's, and I've got what he wants to say, then I can come out and say, let there be boom in my family. You know, let there be this in my family, whatever it might be. And so it brings change because you've got to recognise that you are the agent of change upon the earth. You are the transformational agent. You are the one that is the apostle. You're the one that's sent. You are the one. It's an apostolic age. Every believer is an apostle. An apostle is one that is sent. Every believer is sent. So you've got your own destiny, your own assignment. You're sent to people to talk to them about Jesus. You are sent by God in your work. You're sent. So every believer is an apostle and you are to bring transformation and change. It's not just about the fivefold. It's about the body of Christ. The fivefold is just to equip the body of Christ to go and do what God's called them to do. But the body of Christ, every one of you is an apostle, which means every one of you has got to walk in authority. Every one of you. Stop laughing. It's really, really important because if you don't walk in authority, the devil walks in authority on you.
You are the one with the power and the dominion of Jesus Christ. God, God has basically given you a blank check, which Jesus has signed. Now go, he says, go, go and bring heaven to earth. Go and bring healing. Go and bring deliverance. Go and bring salvation. Go and change that business so that it becomes profitable. Go and go, go and do. It's a blank check. Every one of you have got blank checks, unlimited blank checks in your checkbook from heaven that you can use for anything, signed by Jesus in his blood, handed to you by the Father. You've got the authority. You've got a blank check. You've got the power of attorney to use the name of Jesus and the authority of Jesus Christ upon the earth. We can no longer afford to sit back. Not, I'm saying that you do, but generally speaking, the church can no longer afford to sit back and say, Father, would you please do this? Father, would you please do that? At some stage, the kids have got to grow up. At some stage, I don't mind tying my grandchildren's shoelaces when they're little, but when they're 12, if you can't figure out how to tie your own shoelace, it's a problem, right? So the church has also got to grow up. We've got to walk in the authority of Jesus Christ. We've got to carry that authority, that dominion. It's a dominion mandate that was given to us in Genesis chapter 1, 27 and 28, when God said, I bless you. Now uh, that blessing is an empowerment. Now be um, multiply, be fruitful, fill the earth, replenish it, subdue it, which means there's going to be problems. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be a disruption, as Myron Golden says. It's the law of disruption. Everything starts off good and then bang, you've got something you've got to subdue. <laughs> and so, but subdue it because God warned us that that was going to be there. You need this. Now, when Adam sinned, he got everything back, or Noah got everything back, except dominion authority. God said, instead of walking in dominion authority now, the animals will be afraid of you. So if you want to turn to Genesis 9... I've got to preach on Wednesday morning at this conference on apostolic prayer before all apostles. <laughs> and there's question and answer time. <laughs> so it's so like, oh my gosh. <coughs> I, I would have preferred to have been given another subject. <laughs> but anyway, so Noah and his sons, have a look in chapter 9, verse 1. God pronounced a blessing upon Noah and his sons, a blessing like Adam, and he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Same as Adam, right? And what is the next thing that Adam was given? Dominion. So, and, and then he says, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the land, every bird of the air, all that creeps upon the ground and fish of the sea. They are delivered into your hand, but there was no dominion authority. So man lost dominion authority when Adam fell. Right? He fell and dominion authority was taken away. But now through Jesus Christ, the second Adam, the life-giving spirit, through Jesus, everything is restored back to God's original intent and purpose. And so we now have been given that authority back. But up until Jesus, they didn't have it. And so what the devil has wanted to do, and I'm giving him no glory whatsoever, was that if he could keep the church blindfolded to the fact that they had this authority, he could still win. Now, he doesn't. But that's what he's wanted to do. He's wanted to keep us unaware of what we have. So remember that video that we saw, you know, that, that weird title, I Married a Witch, when I was on the day of my birth. You know, like you see that and you think, oh, I don't want to watch that. But you saw it. Remember that he said in that, when that little, that um, teenager confronted him when he was at the height of his satanic powers and this 19-year-old girl stood in front of him because God told her to go and, and speak to him and she said, God, you know what he's like. I don't want to go anywhere near him. And then God said, no, you go. I want you to go and talk to him. So she thought, well, I'm going to go at 7 o'clock in the morning and he won't be up. 
And so I can do what God asks, but he won't be there, so I can come back. You know, she was thinking, it's not going to work. But guess who was there at 7 o'clock in the morning? And so he comes out and he was aware that something was on and he called in 600 other witches to stand with him in the spirit in front of this little 19 year old believer because she was confronting him with Jesus Christ. But when he looked at her, all he saw was Jesus. And all the witches that had come to his support fled because at that name they would have to bow their knee. So they fled so they wouldn't have to bow their knee. And so he's standing there and she got, what was it, 19, 19 other witches, said Satanists? 17. 17 other Satanists. Um, she got complete born again, spirit filled. And God said to her that the youngest child in the body of Christ is stronger than the strongest Satanist. Mm. Yes. And she got 17 Satanists. She got born again, spirit filled, took them through deliverance and healing. James Kowalia went through 10 years of deliverance and healing to be set right. Most of them are now in ministry, but they kept looking to her. And she went to the Lord and she said, Lord, if I, if, if I have finished my assignment and if these men are looking to me more than they are looking to you, take me home. So he did. But most of those are now still in, in ministry, are in ministry. But it was the authority. And each and every one of us, you are, whether you are aware of it or not, you are going to have power encounters. There is going to be somebody that you will come face to face with. Something will happen where there will be a power encounter and you are going to have to have that authority and you're going to have to walk in it. And you can say, Father, please help on the inside, but that had better not come out of your mouth. What had better come out of your mouth had better be authority. Power encounters are, are speeding up in, in our realm. And you need to be able to stand. And you need to be able to handle it the way that Jesus would. Beautiful thing is with Jesus, praise God for Jesus. He came to earth as a human being, right? And he showed us how to live under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So whatever Jesus did, you can do. And in John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus said, the things that I do, you're going to do and greater still because I've gone to the Father. So you're going to do something even greater than Jesus did. And I can't even comprehend what that could be. I still haven't walked on water. I still haven't turned water into wine. I'm working on stuff, right? But there's, there's things that he wants to do in us and with us and through us and for us. People he wants to touch, things he wants to change, circumstances, businesses, uh, atmospheres, a whole heap of areas that God wants to release heaven on earth. That's what I love about the Celts, apart from the fact that I come from a Celtic line. The Celts, they they call their colonies, colonies of heaven on earth. I love that. I would love open heaven to be known as a colony of heaven on earth. You know, where you step in and you step into the presence of God and the, the power of God and the love of God and the redemption of God and the transformation of God. But things change. Amen. When we get our own place and people pull up in the car park, for them to feel the presence of God even in the car park. You know, they know that this is a place where they can be helped, where there's hope, where things can be changed. And it's, not, it's going to come because of authority and because of power. And, um, you know, Adam disobeyed and he forfeited that authority. But through Jesus Christ, we get it back. Yeah. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there's a comparison between the first and the last Adam. Verse 45, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual life which came first, but the physical, then the spiritual. The first man was from out of earth, made of dust. The second man, the Lord, from out of heaven. Now those who are made of the dust are like him who was first made of the dust. And the Amplified says, earthly minded. And as the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven, heavenly minded. And just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, 
so shall we also bear the image of the man of heaven. Who's ever read that book of that Chinese man who was incarcerated, the heavenly man? Yeah, yeah right? Um, he, he took on the image of Jesus so much he was known as the heavenly man. And so this, this is our thing. We've got to completely move away from the dust, the earthly minded stuff and move into heavenly minded. That we're consumed by the anointing. That things change. You know, we've, we've been so blessed. Danielle and I, we're just continually saying to each other, we're just so blessed. Like we are just so blessed. A, a couple of weeks ago, I just needed to get some new clothes and we went in to get them. I was speaking at the ASP conference and I busted my arm and I just wanted something to wear, you know. So we walked into this shop and everything in the shop was $40. Okay, everything. And it was a shop that usually like it's $180, $200, but I wanted something flash for the conference. And we went, wow. So we walked out with a little bit more than $200 worth of clothes. <laughs> uh, 40 bucks, right? And then we're coming back from the Sunshine Coast yesterday and um, I said, I need some things for Singapore. Um, it's a new level. And I just wanted that little bit of extra confidence. I'm, I'm, I'm not used to, I'm speaking with people that I've got books that they've written, you know, like, oh, I've got your books. But I can't behave like that. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I said to Danny, I just want to get a couple of things. So I'm, I'm, I just, and I didn't lose the weight I wanted to lose before and all that kind of stuff's going you through your head as a woman, you know. And, and so um, I said, I just need to get some new clothes. And we, we couldn't stay awake driving back from the sunny coast. So we stopped at Logan Hyperdome and we walked into three shops. Yeah, three shops. <laughs> <laughs> three shops and, most, and nearly everything in the three shops was $20. Wow. And I thought, I want this anointing for shopping to yeah. stay. <laughs> But it was just amazing, wasn't it, love? So we walk out saying, we're so blessed. We're so blessed. We're so blessed. But the more you say it, the more you live it, right? I'm so blessed. I'm so healthy. I'm so grateful for my good health. I'm so grateful that, you know, for my good health. I'm so grateful, Lord, for what you've done in my body. The more you say it, the more you manifest it, the more you live it. And it doesn't matter how long you've continued in a situation or a circumstance, you can change that. Because sometimes when we've, we've been in a situation for a while and things haven't really changed, the mindset starts to form a stronghold that it's not going to change. Yeah. You know, I've been this way for so many years. I've done everything I know to do as a Christian. <clears throat> Nothing changes. And so we've kind of get this fatalistic, oh, well, that's just the way it is. I'm going to have to put up with this until, you know. But that's not God. That's not God. That's a stronghold that we've allowed to form. So what is it that we need to change? Because he's taken, through Jesus, he's taken each and every one of us back to what we were before Adam fell, to his original intent and purpose, which means we live in divine health, divine wisdom, divine provision, divine protection, divine peace, divine joy. We walk in the presence of the Lord. The Spirit of God is with us at all times. It's just the most amazing thing that God has blessed us with. But we don't realise that because we still say things like, oh, well, you know, I've been um, sick like this for so many years or, oh, but that's just who I am. That's just, you know, and, and what we do is we reconnect to the old self or we reconnect to a disappointment or a disillusionment because the prayer hasn't been answered. And we've got to cut off all those disappointments and disillusionments and say, okay, God, I know it's not your end, it's my end. And, but I want a, a fresh start with this. I've, be, I've had to put up with this for years but I want a fresh start. Jesus has redeemed me out of this. It's not manifested. So I ask you to show me what I need to know so that the truth comes that brings the freedom so that it's manifested in my life. What is the truth? And so often we think, well, I've prayed, I've fasted, uh, I've done this, I've done that, I've spent time in the Word. I get up between midnight and three. You know, we're I, 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 I. But it's not about what we do. It is about what Jesus Christ has done at the cross. It's about his finished work. It's about the stripes that he bore on his back, the crown of thorns that was jammed onto his head. It's about the, the, the nails in his hands and in his feet. It's about the being unjustly accused. It's about unjust, um, vind, um, unjust 
verdicts handed out by Pontius Pilate. It's about the fact that he took on the sin of every person in the whole wide world so that we could be set free. It's about him. And the minute we start to say, but I've done this and I've done that, our focus is off our saviour, our king and our God, and it's onto us and we're completely missed the plot. Yeah. Right? It comes back to him. It must be Jesus at all times. Yeah. Must be. Yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't, it's not it just doesn't work. It's him. It's about his, what he's done. And the minute I start to say, but I've done this and I've done that, I have fallen into works. Yeah. I've gone back into religion and I'm not in a relationship. Yeah. And it's about the fact that, well, what I've done should matter. Who said it should matter? Well, it's what Jesus does that matters. Yeah. And so in this kingdom thing, our focus is to be Jesus. It says in Colossians, I'll finish with this, and it won't be an evangelistic finish. It'll be a true finish. But um, in Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. If then you have been raised with Christ to a new life. Have you been raised with Christ? Yeah. yeah. So you can get rid of the if. You have been raised with Christ to a new life. This is the Amplified. And you share his resurrection from the dead. So aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And set your mind and keep your mind set on what is above, on the higher things, not on the things that are on the earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died. Yes. And your new life is hidden with Christ in God. Amen. As far as this world is concerned, you're dead. Where was this, Harry? 3-3. Three, three. And so, you know, um, and it's one thing to say as far as this world is concerned, you've died. Thing is, as far as I'm concerned, is the world dead to me? Is the world dead to me? I love nature and I love the beauty. I love all that. But the ways of the world, dead to me. TV's been off in my, because uh, often I get tired, I go home and I just turn on something to watch. And I enjoy the British crime shows, the police shows. I think I just like seeing the baddies caught. But the TV's been off because God said to me, you either live by that. Otherwise, you're not living. So the TV's off. And this is the frustrating part. I have stopped with the foods that he said to stop. Nothing has changed. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still working on it, you know. <laughs> but the thing is, we've got to be dead to the things of this world. Is your mind set on things above? Even when you think about your family, your finances, your health, is your mind set on things above? No, I've been healed by stripes. No, he promised to meet my every need. As for me and my household, we will be saved. Or are you dragged back into the, the dust, the earthly ways? And this is a discipline that we have to ask the Holy Spirit to do. Because if I do it, I'm going to mess up. But if I do it, it also works. So Holy Spirit, help me to live this. Convict me, change me, show me. Holy Spirit, you have to do it. So we have to learn to live kingdom in order to bring kingdom to manifest kingdom. And one of the aspects of kingdom that is going to be engulfing us in these days that are coming is the glory, the absolute glory of God. It's the most wonderful thing. It's weighty. It's honour and so many other things in the, in the Hebraic language. It's about 12 or 13 different things that, is, that comprises glory. But in order to bring the kingdom... You have to know how to live kingdom. And you have to walk in kingdom authority and speak as a kingdom citizen. Verse 
because we all want to see miracles, signs and wonders. But actually God says of us in Isaiah that we are to be the sign and the wonder. We are to be the sign and the wonder. I'm all for that. Any questions or any comments? Training for Wednesday for me. Good, nothing. Okay, bye. <laughs> any questions, any comments? Shelley. If what is coming is the apostolic power, <coughs> sorry, what was the power we had in the 70s? Because things were happening then. Yes, we they were. Gone. They were gone. Mm -hmm. We healed. The person was healed. So what was the power we had then? You know what I think it was? I think it was the power of the word. Everything yeah. was word and spirit. Yes. Sure. Word and spirit. Yes. Yeah. And, and now we either have lots of the spirit and very little word or we have lots of the word and very little spirit. But back then it was the combination of the word of God and the spirit of God. Because yeah. the first question you got asked when they asked if you're born again, the second question was, are you filled with the spirit? Yes. Right? And if you said no, everybody within a, a couple of miles will come and lay their hands on you and pray in the spirit until you prayed in tongues. Yes. It's very easy to start on a path like that and say, yep, that's the path I'm going, I'm going to do this. How do you catch and put yourself up on those, the small, it starts off small where you're not living that and then it just gets bigger and bigger until you've totally forgotten what you, the new lifestyle you're living. How do you circumvent that? Listen to the Holy Spirit because he brings the conviction. Okay, don't listen to the condemnation because that's the enemy and there's no hope when there's condemnation. But the Holy Spirit's job description is actually to convict us. So listen, build, build an awareness of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's what I would say. Other people might have different views. I just, more of a challenge, more of a thought. Um, Want to mention referring back to how Timothy says to pray for mm -hmm. all authority. However, I'm sitting because this is about the fourth time I've heard that. I, something that's caught my attention. Like mm, there's something a bit different because Yeshua, when the apostles asked him to, pr how should we pray? He said to Abba Father. Yeah. And there was no mentioning of praying for authority in there. So looking just at some commentaries, and this is just for everyone to sit with and see where it is. It's really showing the stark difference between, because that was back in a day when the authorities were very pagan, very much into mm -hmm. all sorts of worship, that even in those, even those sort of people to pray for so that we have peace. At least this is what I'm, I'm mm -hmm. seeing. If you see something different, so what are you actually saying? I'm just, I'm just saying, um, not, I, I guess I was feeling like, oh man, I always begin to pray for authority, you know, but it's, I do pray for authority, but not the start of every prayer. And I think if that was the procedure, then Yeshua would have told his apostles, first let's pray for I think but the, the, the change there, I think, is that Yeshua was teaching them personal prayer, <coughs> personal needs, my daily bread, as opposed to, as an opposed to other, other things. I think, I think. Mm. Um, but, and Timothy, you've got to remember, Timothy had a massive church. I think it was about 10,000 people or something in Timothy's church. And a lot of issues. And I had a lot of issues. Um, so, you know, he would want to clean stuff up. Um, and, and even if you just like, even if we just, when we said grace and just said, Father, would you bless our city with peace and prosperity? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's all it takes. Jeremiah 27, 29. Jeremiah 29 verse 7 says, If you pray for the peace and the prosperity of the city you are in, which for the people that then was Babylon, couldn't get any worse than that for the Jews. He said, pray for the peace and the prosperity of the city you are in, then you will have peace and prosperity as it is peaceful and prosperous. So even if we just did that, 
or um, you know, when you got your got your pay or your income. God, I just want to thank you because tax is always taken, right? Mm -hmm. So God, I just want to thank you for this. I thank you for the government. I thank you for a righteous government with a just economic system for this nation. But it doesn't have to be massive or big. God bless King Charles and his family. Save them all. Right? That's it. We don't have to spend hours in intercession. But, I, but one of my mentors taught me, do, when, you, when you do something, stick a prayer habit onto it. So whenever I left my house, I would pray Job 1.10. Whenever I get in my car, I pray the, the prayer that Billy Brim prays over her cars. You know, um, Trey loved it so much. He used to pray it for mass, uh, not mass, blessing the meal. Um, but if you've got a habit and you're doing something, like somebody said to me, when you iron your baby's clothes, pray over them. So if you start to add a prayer to something you do, you're not taking any extra time, but you're making that minute count. And, and honestly, if the people of the Gold Coast would just, when they bless their food, yeah. and Father, would you bless our, city, our mayor and our city with peace and prosperity, thank you, boom, yeah. it would make a big difference.